semester long, right? Every class, that's what we do. Yeah. So, Nathaniel Walker. Thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you for the beautiful poem. Uh, thank you for inviting Dr. O, thank you for inviting myself and my students to be a part of this extremely important project. Uh, I know it's getting late and everybody just had some food and they're starting to feel a little bit like that time, right? So I'm going to try to be quick. But basically, what we want to show you now is that it's 13 different ideas, different proposals, each one of them unique, for, for possibilities. Ways that we might honor the 36 ancestors that were found at this site, right, uh, and that will soon be reinterred, uh, and then we hope honored in a public and permanent, and we also hope very majestic fashion. Uh, very briefly, before the first student comes up to present her design, I wanted to share with you some of our methods, but again, I'll be quick, right? Uh, so, first of all, um, we concentrated on the fact that this is a sacred site, right? This is sacred ground. And it's, it's not only sacred ground, because 36 people were interred there, most likely by their loved ones, uh, who mourned for their loss, and who saw this place as sacred as a result of the fact that their loved ones were placed there. But also simply uh, because this spot, this Anson Street burial ground, is surrounded by other sacred spaces. Right? Not far, uh, is, uh, there's a number of churches very close, including, of course, Mother Emmanuel and me, right? And uh, not far from, uh, from the site also is the, the former uh, uh, horror, sorry, the, the former horror scape of Gaston's Wharf, which, uh, as you can see on the... I'm going to have to be a little more careful with this thing. The clicker should help. Gaston's Wharf, as many of you know, and some of you probably don't know, is going to be the site of the new International African American Museum. And the reason that the museum was chosen for that site is because the Gaston's Wharf is of central importance uh, in African American history. Um, if I use a little later, that enormous piece of land is Gaston's Wharf. And for a number of years in the early 19th century, that was the only place where it was legal to bring slave ships directly from Africa. And because that was the only place where that was possible, a lot of ships came in. And every once in a while, capitalism being what it is, the commodification of human beings being what it is, the price would go down, and human beings were stored in warehouses, left to die, so that the price would go back up. And at one point, the city had to pass a law against throwing bodies in the river, because so many bodies were thrown in the river, it killed the local fishing industry. And I think that says a lot about this site, about that as well. And it's very possible that the people who were buried here in the late 18th century, when that wharf was being built, were exposed to some of the horrors of that site. And if they weren't, their children and their grandchildren certainly were. This is sacred ground, not only because of the 36, but because of the thousands that lived and died and still live and die in the nearby area. Marion Square is not far. Our students were, my students were asked to look at the memorial landscape of Charleston as it currently stands. And as all of you know, there are a lot of monuments in Charleston, a lot of memorials in Charleston, some of them very big and very beautiful. And many of these are for white supremacists. Right? They've been around a long time, and their message was clear when they went up, and it's clear today. And John C. Calhoun is a huge, beautiful, magnificent monument to white bigotry. We've got another huge, beautiful monument to the Tickle Peninsula to white folly. Meanwhile, we have only a few little tiny monuments to black privilege, such as Robert Small's monument to Waterfront Park, which I challenge you to find in the dark. But it's hard enough to find in the middle of the day. It's tiny, obscured by foliage. Robert Small is a national, indeed, a, a planetary hero as far as I'm concerned. He deserves a lot more than a little plaque and a little piece of concrete. There's another monument I love, I cherish, and I consider to be exemplary. It's the little brick monument to the enslaved workers who built the Unitarian Church. This is new. This is a big step in the right direction. And in fact, I wouldn't change a thing about this memorial. But this memorial may not serve alone as, as an indicator of black agency and heritage in Charleston. And one of the reasons it can't do that job on the citywide level is because it's very small. I did some undercover research, and I looked like a real idiot. And I sat there, and I ate an apple, and I pretended to be a tourist, and I listened to how many of the carriage tours mentioned one word about this monument and the enslaved workers it was designed to, to broadcast. Not a one. 
We talk about the church in great detail. We talk about the color, the ornamentation, all the wonderful things about the church. Not a single word about that monument. And if you can tell, they're all looking at the monument now. But actually, they're not. They're looking at me, crouching next to the monument, and wondering what that weird guy is doing. Crouched yeah. next to that strange weird thing, of which they don't know what it's about, nor will they ever know what it's about. Right? I love that monument. Right? But that monument is just the beginning. We have to do a lot better. We have to compete with these huge, beautiful white supremacist things. If we can't take them down, we should at least compete with them. And just to tell, to give something honest about the glory of black achievement in Charleston. And quit treating black history like a footnote in the, in the story of Charleston. <laughs> Thank this is not just about the past. As we have seen in our own city and indeed throughout the nation, memorials and monuments and stories we tell about ourselves, to ourselves, and to our children, and to other people. Right? These, these affect the way we understand the present and the way we understand the future. People are willing to fight and to kill over this kind of politics. And we need to do a better job of broadcasting the right message to our children and to each other and to the world about what Charleston is about. So, after studying the memorial landscape of Charleston and studying this site, King David, I'll count on you for this one. Okay. All right. Um, our students then, hey, there we go. Yeah, yeah, exactly. With a pyramid on top. So my students then considered memorial and monumental architectural touch from around the world with a special emphasis on Africa, right? And of course, Egypt is famous for its obelisks. We've got some obelisks in town. And some people might suggest, well, really, can you really put Egypt in with Black History King David? What do you say to that? I'm very, very happy and proud to say that Egypt is a part of Africa. But even if there was a cynic who refused to acknowledge that Egypt was a part of Africa, well, guess what? All you have to do is travel a few miles south down the Nile to the Ethiopia, where you can find obelisks just as magnificent and, and monumental and splendid. Single stones, right, carved and ascended to the heavens. And there's no dispute that Ethiopia is a part of black history. And I, you know, and there's no disputing the genius of their accomplishments. Not only do they have magnificent obelisks, which my students found inspiring, as you'll soon see, but they also have huge monolithic churches carved out of solid bedrock, right? And these places are just as magnificent in person as they are on the screen. I know because four days ago I was in that church. And the reason I'm telling you this is because I was invited to Ethiopia to participate in a conference about African architecture and urbanism to talk about Charleston. Charleston's not an African. Oh, yes, it is. Uh, Charleston is, is I, 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 made the, I made the argument that Charleston was a part of greater Africa. That you cannot understand Charleston without, without foregrounding the African diaspora. That this city would not look the same, it would not taste the same, it would not sound the same, and in fact, it wouldn't be here without Africa. Right? And they bought it. And they welcomed me to Ethiopia, and I got to speak about Charleston and receive an invitation from the head of Addis Ababa's architecture school to build a bridge between the College of Charleston and the great university of Addis Ababa. Right? Oh. So, this is just to say, the Africans are also paying attention. They want to know if we're doing justice to ourselves and to their cousins and their brothers and sisters. So, moving to West Africa, which is where many of the bodies, as we know already from the teeth analysis, came from, there are monumental stone constructions in Senegal. These are huge monolithic stones that were extremely heavy, very difficult to, to create and to move, and then would create a landscape of, of houses for the dead. Right? This is funerary architecture, a wonderful model for the kind of things we need to do at the ancestry burial ground. Permanent houses made in stone to honor forever ancestors. We looked at magnificent patterns in, uh, in African textiles and in African architecture, the kind of mathematical and ornamental patterns you can stare at for days and never get bored. Right? We looked at the beautiful symmetry and the, orna the ornamental uh, sophistication of things like chairs and silverware and all the other wonderful things that many, many, many diverse West African cultural groups produce and have produced for centuries, including these magnificent uh, Aquapokonu, which are golden sun discs, right? These things could be made out of hammered gold. They are often made out of lost wax casting, extremely sophisticated technically. These things represent the power of the human soul to absorb the light of the sun and then broadcast it 
right? Broadcast it to, to neighboring human beings. And act as a conduit for beauty and renewal and youth. This is something that also speaks to the power of the ancestors who dwell in the heavens and can communicate with us today. That magnificent metalwork has, of course, deep roots in West Africa, where the amazing uh, cast bronzes of the of Ife culture, for example, still amaze people to this day. These were made in the 14th century, way better artistically or technically than anything happening in England in the 1300s, like you promise you, right? And that deep tradition of metalwork has direct lineage to Charleston today, when many of the enslaved people who came here knew how to work iron better than any Europeans, and they filled this city with their magnificent artwork. So Iron Bomb binds Charleston visibly to Africa. So do these wonderful sweetgrass baskets, these, these woven, beautiful artworks that are almost identically made in Sierra Leone to this day. Another visible, tangible link between America and Africa. But there are also millions and millions of invisible links, things that we heard about earlier, the hidden hands that built this city. If you go to the slave market museum today, you know Isaac Clark will point out to you the fingerprints in the bricks. When you see a fingerprint in a single brick, you then see all the other bricks differently. When you see the bricks differently, you see the buildings differently. When you see the buildings differently, you see the city differently. And you realize this place was made by the city of Athens. This city was built by black people. And there are people today trying to call attention to this. Like the College of Charleston alone, a local photographer and artist, Dr. Trey Major, that has set up a next uh, photography exhibition that was displayed shortly at the Gilead. It will be displayed again next year. And Joe McGill did a big role in this project, Fingerprints in Clay, right? trying to help us to see Charleston in a different light by tracing these intent, these tangible, but nonetheless often overlooked evidence of, our, of, of African agency and history. Right? And then, of course, Jonathan Green's famous sets for Corky and Bess which took the inner African truth of every building in Charleston and then turned the architecture inside out, foregrounding and celebrating that African agency. All of those things happened at the Gilead, right? Dr. Major's exhibit, the Jonathan Green's Porgy and Bess, and indeed the Gilead itself is full of woven motifs that are designed to evoke sweetgrass baskets. Now, we can do better, guys. We start, we're slowly starting to do better in recognizing what Charleston is, which is a beautiful intersection between America, Africa, and Europe. And the fact is, the African connection has been ignored and downplayed for far too long. So this site is sacred. It has so many opportunities due to its surrounding area, due to all of these efforts at the Gilead to foreground African heritage. But it also has some challenges. It's not the biggest site in the world. We want to do a monument that is properly monumental, right? Not another, no, no. So how do we do something that is both bold and beautiful but yet also respectful of the site and not so disproportionate that it seems ridiculous. So in, in different ways, you see uh, that, that uh, my students attempted to amplify the power of their design, not always through size, but sometimes through color or through light or through other methods. Now, whenever you see the designs, in our final exhibition, we're going to incorporate the designs into photographs of the site. But for now, you'll see the, you know, the designs kind of floating uh, in space, but there'll be a little key to show you where the student intends to put the monument. Sometimes it's right in the corner, that very prominent corner, where Anson Street meets George Street. Sometimes it's between the two great oak trees, which are very beautiful and can serve as a wonderful frame for a monument. One student decided to turn one of the oak trees into the monument, which I think is a kind of cool idea. Right? So keep an eye out for that one. For now, I'm going to turn it over to the students. Welcome, Leah Bancheri, who's going to present this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Leah Bancheri, and my design was directly inspired by two African monument types. The first is the obelisk which comes from Ethiopia and Egypt, 
Thus suspended between past and future, they can remember and reflect joyfully, lifted by the great strength of their ancestors. The surrounding stones represent community and are engraved in West African pattern, which will account for the 36 individuals that are buried here. There are women, men, and children who are buried there. A plaque in front, finally, will provide information about them and the world that they want to see. I hope for this design to be reflective and hopeful. Lifting 
continue to the even child and spin it with one hand. As visitors rotate the engraved road, they'll learn about the 36th period here, about Africa and about America, about slavery, and about the world that enslaved Africans built, including the city of Chelsea. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is uh, Robert. Um, so this is my design. Um, one of the greatest crimes of slavery was that family, band, was that family bonds were shit shattered as a human being of rock and soul, great cruelty. Today, thanks to the rapidly developing science of genetics, it's possible to reestablish the knowledge of family connections. This pavilion accordingly celebrates a bond between the 36 people buried here and the living people of Charleston and America today. The material is mostly wrought iron, drawing from the grounds like DNA strands, just as the legacies of the people buried nearby continue to fill the living world. Waves of the cornice symbolize the ocean that bridges Africa and America, while the lacy dome represents a bridge between the lower realm and heaven, where we will all be reunited. As an iron Sankofa crowns the pavilion, this is an Asante Adrinkus symbol for learning the past to move forward into the future. My name is Kendall Leisure. Um, I designed this wonderful fountain that will stand proud near the site of the burial ground where 36 Charlestonians of African descent will finally receive the public honor that they deserve. My art support shaped seeds of seagrass and sweetgrass are numbered and bundled together to represent the different groups of people who were found here. 16 men, 10 women, two unidentified, two unidentified adults, four children, two infants, and two unidentified people. Their lives are poetically depicted emerging from the base of the fountain and weaving themselves into the sweet grass, baskets representing the passing sequence of generations. Sparkling the water will cascade from the top of the fountain through each sweet grass basket, showing the never-ending vitality of the African-American people of Charleston. The brick wall will also serve as seating and an iron plot will be incorporated to give information about the prairie sites nearby. Living sweetgrass and indigo will wrap around the side as well. Hello all, thank you for this opportunity. My name is Jay Michaela and this is called Waves of Memory. This intimate plaza will be grasped by a brick bench that gradually rises and then crests like a great wave, evoking the ocean that bridges Africa and America, which carries so many people to the shores of South Carolina. Capped by sparkling marble, this wave will also feature an informative plaque offering visitors insight into the people who were buried nearby and explaining what we know about their place of origin and their lives. At the center of the plaza is a great digital drum with four panels. When visitors strike this drum, the noise will ring loudly, echoing the joyful percussion music of many West African societies, as well as the drums of resistance that helped guide the Stono Slave Rebellion in 1739. In the evening, striking the drum will cause the 36 glass panels in the brick pavement and the wall to pulse with light. The music will summon the spirits of the ancestors into a celebration with the living. Thank you.
tell a story or to share a dream or concern. The, memory, the memorial is thus a living place where memories and hopes are gathered and transmitted by living Charlestonians. Um, on regular occasions, a local person will offer information about the 36 people buried here and what we know about their lives. This will be a safe place to come to learn and to teach, to gather and to sing about the past, present, and future.
including a great girl walk, which is revered for its ability to shelter community gatherings. 36 beautiful bond lanterns will be placed at different intervals along the branches of the tree. Large ones will represent the hovering spirits of adults, and the small lights will evoke the little ones buried here. They should be engraved with West African patterns drawn from the art and architecture of places like Sierra Leone and Ghana, and lit from within. Their lights will glow softly until a visitor sits on a circular bench under the tree, which will cause the lights to pulse and grow in intensity, welcoming the passerby who has come to honor their African ancestors. Thank you.
encourage people to interact with it in that way because it is it is a barrel ground. That's how we traditionally have interacted um, with the debt. You are, wow, you are quite so. Yeah, you, you pay attention to detail, and that's great. Uh, thank you guys for presenting all this. This, 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 this is all beautiful. Um, we're going we're gonna to build some great things in the future, so that's beautiful. Hey, the first one I saw up there, uh, let's see, learning together, lifelong, lifelong spirits. Um, reading it. Oh, there you go. So the uh, the obelisk, really, were, were you trying to get an A out of that from Africa? Because that's what I see. Oh, yeah. That's good, John. That's good. That's, that, that's what I see here. Um, and then there was another one that, that I saw. Um, you see the standing coast of that? Is that the one that looks like the seagrass grass? Yeah. Olivia. That's, that's, that's great. And then I saw one. The, the Shining Spirit Tree, Bottle Tree, who's that? Yeah, I like that. I like that idea. And I saw one with the, with the brick base. Uh, who had that brick base? With, uh, with the water fountain. Who had the water fountain? The fountain. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Um, you know why I like that? And I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, I bring a bias to the table. Uh, you guys saw uh, something flashing on the screen doing your, your presentation. You saw that hand, you saw that hand, touch the brick, that was my hand. You see the brick? That's the other thing. So, you know, I, I look for I look for these bricks around the city, and I saw the bricks in, in your design, and I, and I thought, you know, there are a lot of uh, buildings that were torn down, a lot of academic buildings that were torn down. People say the bricks. You know, I better you look, do those bricks for bricks with fingerprints on them. You can find some. I imagine if you can compose your design with those bricks. I thought that was, was a great idea. So, so those are the things that I noticed. Again, I'm not as, as particular as I, So it's, it's, it's okay. So thank you guys for all of your, uh, your input.